Hi everyone and welcome to the second of our Whole School Send webinars on returning to school and making use of trauma-informed approaches. I'm Erica Wollstonehome, the Regional Send Lead for the South West and once again this afternoon we have Ian Hunking with us who's the director of the Sigma Teaching School, which is part of the Delta Education Trust, as well as Francesca and Mia from Whole School Send, who are providing some much needed technical support. Now, I'm going to go through some of the technical information, which I will read, and we've got some slides as well. So if you haven't attended one of our Zoom webinars before, there are, are a few different ways that you can communicate with us. If you've got specific questions for either Ian or myself, you can submit them through the Q&A box below. We've got over 300 attendees with us today, so we expect quite a few questions. We'll try and answer some of them live, but any we don't get to will be collected and answers will be sent out with the slides. There's also the chat function, which you can use to introduce yourselves and network with the other people in the webinar. Please ensure your chat, chat function is set to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. We'll be sharing the presentations with you on screen today. If you feel they're too small, go to the top of the screen, select viewing options and take, change your Zoom ratio to 150%. We also recommend watching the presentation in speaker view with the chat open in the side by side view. We'll be sending out a survey tomorrow, which you can use to give feedback on the event itself. We'd really appreciate you taking the time to fill this out so that we can improve our future events. And all the presentation slides will be shared with you in the follow-up emails. So, once again, we have Ian as our main speaker. And this is the second in our series of, of webinars on making use of trauma-informed approaches. Ian trained as an educational psych psychologist. He has been the director of a multi-services agency and a head teacher. And since schools closed for the majority of their children, Ian has published a series of resources to support both adults and children, which he has provided free. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ian now and thank you very much. And I'm just going to switch off my, um, no, sorry. I think that's fine. That's mine that's gone up, I think, now. So we're, we're good. I've got a nod from Francesca, which is always reassuring. That's that's my screen up, I think. So you're good. Erica, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Anybody who's come back to this as a second of three webinars, welcome to anybody who's joining us for the first time. It will be adaptable. I'll make it work for both of you. If you are at the first webinar, there are things I'm going to build on. If you went to the first webinar and you haven't had a chance to catch up with it as, as a video because it is recorded, you can. Um, it's not a problem. I will make reference and join things up. Okay, as, as Erica said, um, today, second of three webinars, and particularly going to focus today on the transformative power of feeling safe, and then the slightly challenging title of what about when it goes wrong. Hopefully it won't go wrong too often, but clearly we do need to be well prepared for in case and when it does. Um, the aims for today and the aims for all three webinars are for me to give you an overview of some of the key messages from research. Um, it will be evidence informed, it will be evidence based. If anything that I'm going to say in this next hour is Ian thinks or Ian says I'll make that really clear, but everything will have an evidence base and an evidence informed kind of part to it. Um, I will also hopefully provide you with an opportunity to start to reflect on your own practice in your schools. Um, a lot of that I'm sure will be reassuring and it's lovely to know that's backed up with the research um, about trauma-informed practices. But equally, I'm hoping that some things that you hear from me today or perhaps see from other people in the chat will challenge you and you will think, oh, maybe that's something that I might try with particular individuals or, or larger groups. Um, so hopefully there'll be some useful things to go away and try out as well. And then because I've only got an hour, 
what I will also do, as well as talking very fast, as you will have picked up, I will also signpost you to where you can go if there are particular things you hear about today that you think, oh, that would be useful, I'd like to know more about that, I will be signposting you to places that you can find out more. So hopefully that'll be useful. On the right hand side there, um, I just to restate, it will be evidence informed. Some of the evidence um, based interventions are actually remarkably simple sounding, but they, they really do work incredibly well. So, so bear with me with those and, and we'll talk through some of those. But the great news is that the neuroscience and the psychology has got fabulous stuff to inform us about what we can do to make a difference and what we can do to work. Um, those interventions and approaches that I'm going to touch on in these webinars are absolutely essential practice for children and young people who have been traumatised. Um, either traumatised by this extraordinary time that we're living through or potentially even re-traumatised if they had difficult experiences previously and this has kind of brought some of that back up. Um, but even for those people who are not traumatised by the current situation, which hopefully will be the majority of us, we're remarkably resilient as a species, actually the interventions that I'm talking about will be good practice for all of us because they are trauma reducing, so they are things that will help everybody. Like a lot of interventions for children with additional needs, they're essential practice for children with those special educational needs and as I said, additional needs but actually they're really good practice for everybody. So bear that in mind as we work our way through. This is what we're gonna cover. It's, it's two halves today. The first half will be about the transformative power of feeling safe. I'm gonna to talk to you about the neuroscience, a little bit more detail than I was able to go into in the first webinar. Then I'm gonna share some good news from the neuroscience of things that we can make a difference. And then the even better news from neuroscience about things that actually make a long-term difference too, as well as the immediate difference in the here and now. The second half of today, and I will pause in the middle to give you a chance to ask me some questions, and then I'll rattle on really quickly in the second half. Um, the second half is the bit about, okay, we, we want young people to feel safe. What about when it goes wrong? What about when they're dysregulated, when they're not behaving safely? What do we need to have in place and how can we support them at those very challenging times also? So that comes into a thing called the four R's, which is about regulating, relating, reflecting, and repairing. I'll talk through some of that in the second half of today. I'm particularly gonna focus on regulation and de-escalation. I'm going to brief also touch on relating and repairing but I'm also then going to spend a little bit of time on a thing called the collaborative problem solving approach as part of the reflect part of the, of the four R's that we're going to talk about because it's an incredibly powerful thing to use. Um, the graph, that's not really a graph, the, the picture that you've got on the right hand side that talks about patterns of stress, just to kind of re-emphasize, I'm not suggesting for a minute that all of us are going to end up traumatized by these extraordinary times that we're living through, but that pattern on the, on the right hand side, the pattern of stress, if it goes towards the unpredictable, extreme and prolonged stress, what the neuroscience shows us is that that is the toxic stress that leads, unfortunately, to people being likely to end up being sensitized, traumatized and, and, and vulnerabilities to occur for those people in the short and the medium to potentially long term. A especially if that unpredictable, extreme and prolonged stress is combined without relational support, without what Bruce Perry calls relational buffering, without that relational support. So effectively those kind of trio of toxic stress alongside social isolation, which again does sound horribly like what a lot of young people and perhaps colleagues and maybe even ourselves are living through at the moment. What we can do, and I'm going to touch on today and in the final session, is we can take action to try and make that pattern of stress more predictable for people more moderate and more controllable and then alongside that more predictable more moderate and more controllable stress we can also provide relational support in some very particular ways that i'm going to talk about today and by doing that the great news from neuroscience is not only are we likely to be helping those people who have been traumatized but also will be trauma reducing and actually the neuroscience again shows if we provide stress that is predictable moderate controllable and relational support, relational buffering alongside that, then actually not only do we not traumatise people and we help them come back from being traumatised, but actually we build this fantastic thing called resilience. So that combination, predictable, moderate, controllable stress with the right kind of relational buffering and relational support, which I'll go into some detail of today and in the final webinar in a couple of weeks' time, that's what we can do to really make a difference. That the triangle of circles, if you can have a triangle of circles in the bottom corner there, is just my summary. So today we're going to be talking particularly about safety, in two weeks time we're going to be talking about trust and just to remind people who weren't in the first webinar that trust and that safety are the two foundation cornerstones that need to be in place for learning to happen if we don't have people feeling safe and we don't have trust in relationships which i'll talk about much more in the next webinar um, then simply the learning isn't going to happen so we really need to focus on those elements today the focus is on the safety element 
Okay. So some diagrams to look at. I hope that's okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is Stephen Porges's polylabel theory. I'm going to give you about five minute introduction to Stephen Porges' polylabel theory. I will signpost you to where you can find out more. But this is enormously helpful to know about children and people. So we understand what's happened if they're traumatized. And we also understand what we can do to make a difference. So if we start with the graph, it is a graph this time, in the bottom corner, along the bottom axis, the x axis along here, um, you've got the level of stress. I'm hoping you can see a red line as I'm drawing on that. Is that, am I getting it? No, not, yeah, fantastic. And then up the side here, you've got the level of physiological arousal that occurs in response to that stress. And the three traffic light people are deliberately there because there are different autonomic nervous system states. Our physiology changes at different levels of physiological arousal. So if we are relatively able to stay in this kind of calm and alert state, the part where we're not overly physiologically aroused, we are in that open and engaged, the green bit on the, on the side of your screen there, we're in a state that's the state that we need to be in. Because when we're in that open and engaged, calm and alert, autonomic nervous system state, that is the state in which we're able to socialize, we're able to reflect, we're able to use our problem solving skills, we're flexible, we can be curious, we've got the capacity to learn, we've got a whole lot of health benefits as well because of things that are happening for our immune system and our rest and recovery systems. That is the stuff that we need to be in for, as people. And I'm pleased to say that for the vast majority of time, for the vast majority of us, that is the autonomic nervous system state that we are in. What happens for all of us is if we are triggered by a threat in the environment, if we are triggered into a defensive way of operating because we are perceiving that threat to be significant, we go into one of these other two autonomic nervous system states. We either go into that amber state, which is this kind of alarm fear state here, a little bit higher up the physiological arousal scale as we work through, or if we're absolutely overwhelmed with fear and we are perceiving that that threat is so significant that we can't fight it off and we can't run away from it. We actually go into a third and even more significant, um, be bad for us, um, physiological state. And that is the red state, the freeze and collapse state. If we go into a fight flight state, first of all, that alarm state, we will be more chaotic. We will be oppositional and controlling. Our cortex, the, the thinking part of our brain at the top of our heads, simply goes offline. It's not available to us. It becomes effectively disconnected and offline within our brains. The lower parts of our brain take over the kind of brain stem and, and, and the lower areas around the amygdala, et cetera. Those areas of the brain, the limbic system, they're the parts that take over and try and keep us safe. But to learn or to do all those wonderful things in the open and engaged state, that's what we need the cortex online for. So if we do go into a triggered state of fight and flight, that is when um, we're not able to learn. We're in that kind of you know, physiologically around mobilized state of defense. If we're triggered even more than that, outside of our window of tolerance, even further out of our, um, in terms of the alarm state, and we go into this kind of terror and fear state, the red state, freeze and collapse, then we become even different again. We become rigid, we become withdrawn, we become dissociated, so we're in a kind of not even fully present. We become inaccessible, numb, actually we don't feel things, we can't really tell what's going on feeling-wise, actually even our sense of, of, of pain is, is reduced significantly, and we're effectively immobilized by terror. We don't make a conscious choice as to which of those physiological states we go into. The neuroceptive part of our brain, the, the, the amygdala, is scanning the environment constantly and looking for cues of safety or cues of threat. And it's making a response before it even goes to the thinking cortex part of our brain. It's making an instant response involuntarily saying you're under threat, the body needs to prepare, fight, flight, freeze and, freeze and collapse, or staying open and engaged if we don't feel threatened, if we do feel safe. Just to explain that a little bit in more detail on the graph at the bottom, um, for the majority of us, we can cope with a relatively significant level of stress. If this is us here having a kind of neurotypically kind of response, we're not in a kind of traumatized, overly sensitized, vulnerable position because we haven't had that toxic stress, then what happens is even with a relatively significant level of stress, we can actually get, as you can see here on that graph, we actually get a kind of response we might get close to the edge of the green zone, but actually we need quite a high level of stress to be able to tip us outside of our window of tolerance for our stress response to tip us into one of those two autonomic nervous system states that are either the fight, flight, or the freeze and collapse that I've just explained very briefly. Um, however, as you can probably see on the graph, there will be children and people and probably some colleagues as well who are 
traumatized or sensitized by the experience of things that have gone on for them and they will have a very different response even under that same level of stress so even on the relatively moderate levels of stress, rather than their response, because they have a sensitized stress response, they have an overactive alarm system, their amygdala is even more hypervigilant for threat because of what's happened to them. And actually the same stress for stress response, rather than keeping them in this alarm and calm state, alert and calm state, an open and engaged state, actually tips them into a much more significant state and it can tip them either into that fight, flight, breath, freeze, collapse. It pushes them outside of their zone and, and then they're into those states that we don't want to be in. The difficulty for children and young people who've experienced trauma, for any of us that have experienced trauma, is one of the things that can happen, doesn't always happen, but can happen, is that actually rather than spending most of our time in an open and engaged state, in that alert and calm state, we spend a significant amount of our time oscillating between a frozen and collapsed state and a fight flight state with only very limited time in that kind of open and engaged window of tolerance because our window of tolerance has shrunk because of what's happened to us and our um, sensitivity has, has, has taken on our alarm system is only active sensitized stress response so we're tipped outside of that much more quickly um, so unfortunately people spend less time in it what we clearly need to do is we need to have strategies of helping people feel safe so that they can stay within that open engaged calm and alert green state so all the great things of life can happen not least the learning elements of school can happen as well as everything else that we need to do so we need to give messages of safety and we also need to plan very carefully which is what i'm doing in the second half of today about when people do get tipped into those dysregulated states what can we do to bring them back into that green open engaged state so let's take those one at a time actually just before i do i've mentioned the achievement gap at the bottom there just i've touched on it briefly but i'll let you know what, what happens over time for children and young people if we've got children and young people in our class who are able to stay the majority hopefully will within that open and engaged that calm and alert state then when we provide them with learning opportunities they will be in a place with their brain and everything else that can learn if we how have that have people in that who've got that reduced window of tolerance traumatized people who are more quickly sensitized to stress more quickly tipped outside they will find learning much more difficult and you get an achievement gap because over time the people who are able to access the learning because they're in that state where they can access the wonderful teaching we're providing them make progress um, those that don't however sadly are not in a state where learning can take place the parts of the brain are simply not available to them if they're not in that state so we need to think about them being safe so they can learn otherwise we get an achievement gap over a period of time i've covered everything on that slide apart from one thing the one thing to say that I will share is one of the other things that is really useful to know that happens when we are in a fight flight state, so when we are triggered into a mobilized defensive state, is the muscles in our face tighten. And one of the things that happens when the muscles in our face tighten is the muscles in our inner ears tighten as well. Now that's significant because when our muscles in our inner ears tighten, actually what happens is we become really sensitive to hearing high pitched frequency sounds and low pitched frequency sounds. And what we don't pick out as easily we simply the physiology in our head has changed so we can't hear as well the mid frequency sounds and that's exactly where human voices so when people are in that frozen that fight flight state actually they cannot hear the human voice as easily they simply will not cope with lots of language being spoken at them lots of information being given um so again it's just something we need to be really aware of and we'll touch on um throughout today's session of course for us, in terms of that being hard baked into us physiologically, was a really useful thing historically, because if we were out in the wild and we felt under threat, so we were being hypervigilant for threat, we would want to hear the high pitched screaming sound so we knew what was going on. We'd want to hear the low pitched predator sounds in the bush to be able to hear those and pick those out. And the human voice wouldn't have been quite significant for us. But of course, now when we're not out there trying to survive in the wild in quite the same way, it isn't necessarily useful to us, but it is certainly something we need to be aware of. Okay, let's go to the next bit. So, so the important bit is what can we do? Um, it's useful to understand, but even more important to say, okay, what does that mean and what can we do about that? And, and the good news from the neuroscience is there are two areas of things that we can do that make the world of difference in helping people feel safe and therefore being in that open and engaged state. The first thing we can do is all about relationships. It really is relationships, relationships, relationships. I'm going to do more on relationships in session three, but we need to provide what Bruce Perry talks about. He's the newer scientist who's done a lot of this work. Um, he calls it relational buffering. And, and those bullet points down the slide there are the key elements of relational buffering. So I touched on it in the first webinar. I'll, I'll just mention it again briefly. Um, we need to provide interactions that are cues of safety. One of the main things that our neuroception, our amygdala, scans the environment for to say, am I safe or am I not safe, is actually scanning the other people in our environment. And if it perceives those other people to be safe, then it will give us cues to our brains and to our bodies and all the organs in our bodies 
that we are safe and we'll stay in the open and engaged state. The particular thing that it stands for most of all is our non-verbal signals. So it sounds simple, but it's really, really powerful. If we make an effort to really communicate through our non-verbal signals that we are safe and we are in our own open and engaged state, we will have an impact on the other people in our environment to help to keep them calm and help to keep them open and engaged. They will get messages of safety. So we really need to think about smiling. We really need to think about the prosody, the sing-song nature of our voice rather than the flat tone and the flat facial expressions. We need to think about open gestures, which hopefully I'm modelling without scaring you too much by kind of looking as I'm coming through the screen. Um, so all of those things really do make a huge difference. It sounds simple, but actually at these times when we are probably going to be stressed ourselves, we are going to have uncertainty, we're going to be in a situation where we're likely to be a bit physiologically triggered. We will, if we're not making a conscious effort, not be giving those messages to the children and young people. We need to really think about how we can exaggerate and overcompensate those messages of safety in our non-verbal cues with young people. The second thing we can do is we can deliberately provide check-ins, intentional check-ins, so we can make an effort to regularly say to young people, how are you doing? Um, just cut touch base with them on, on, a kind of, um, on that kind of connection type basis, on a relational one-to-one, -one. ideally, can be in big groups one-to-one -one even better, just to check how they are, see how they're doing. And in particular, for people who've had some level of trauma or some level of stress, goodbyes and hellos, hellos and goodbyes are really, really key. So thinking about our greetings, thinking about our goodbyes, really focusing on those two. Uh, I talked about relational buffering. I'm gonna come onto that in the second half of that that fits with the what about when it goes wrong so actually we need to think about how we provide co-regulation how we can moderate stress by being stress regulators when people are becoming dysregulated hold on to that thought because i'm coming back to it in about 20 minutes time okay appropriate playfulness is really key um, if we can be appropriately playful with other people children adults and colleagues and partners and whoever we've got home actually those are the things that really do help bring down defenses so appropriate playfulness is a great way of giving people messages of safety again i'll pick up a bit more on that in the third webinar and then the, the other issue that we really mustn't overlook is self-care um, actually if we want to provide all of those things that i've just listed that the non-verbal communications, being able to do check-ins and see how people are, that relational buffering and co-regulation when somebody dysregulated as a stress regulator, that playfulness appropriate with children, we need to be in our own good place. So we need to be thinking about our own needs, looking after ourselves. That picture that I've put in the bottom right hand side of your screen, when the adult is in an open, engaged, a calm and relaxed state, actually we will have that impact on the other people. We, we, those kind of physiological states are contagious. So if we can be the calm presence, we will have a calming influence on the other people around us. And again, in the third webinar, the second half of the third webinar, it's going to be more about how we can look after ourselves, our self-care, so that we can be in that state and we can be that secure base that the children and young people need from us. In addition to relational buffering and relational support, the other thing we can do, we can try and provide um, stress that is, we try and make the stress that is there more predictable, moderate and controllable. So we're trying through our actions to move the stress as far as we can on that chart away from being unpredictable, extreme, prolonged into being more predictable, moderate and controllable. And the sorts of actions that we can take there, again, sounds super simple, but they work incredibly well. Familiar routines, um, clear communication, visual timetables, being absolutely clear, checking that people have understood, repeating, reassuring, those sorts of things. Managing transitions, I talked about that in the first webinar, managing those changes, every change is a little bit of a stressor. So how do we manage those and break those into three parts and big transitions and small transitions? Talked about that in the first webinar, as I said. Um, and then we can also think about physiological regulation breaks. Again, in the first webinar, go back and have a look. We talked about what we can do to actually give physiological regulation breaks in small doses throughout the day. So giving the opportunity to do some rhythmic physical movement, to do some work around um, breathing, to do some various bits and pieces. Again, I'm going to touch on that very briefly in a moment. Um, and then we'll do the second part of this to, to show you some things that we can do. And importantly, I'm going to do it as the whole second half of this. We need to have a plan about what, it, what to do when it does go wrong. Um, if we want to help everyone feel safe, we need to have a really clear plan about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it when things start to become unsafe. So we're planned in advance and we're not completely disempowered when things don't go quite as well as we hope they would do and people become dysregulated and, and, and those sorts of issues become difficult if we don't manage them well. So it's about relationships, 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 and it is also about making that stress predictable, moderate and controllable. Bessel van der Kolk, who is a psychologist who specialises in trauma, actually for the second half of that, talks about needing to actually embrace the boring. Um, actually, sometimes we do need to be quite repetitive in the routines, quite repetitive in communication, uh, and those things are helpful to children and people else who've experienced trauma. They need some of that boring, repetitive, knowing where they stand structure elements to things as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, give you a chance to ask me questions in a couple of minutes, but just before I do, the even better news from neuroscience is that if we provide 
that relational support in the ways that I've just talked about, and we'd make that stress more predictable, moderate, and controllable for people. The great news is from the neuroscience, not only does that make a difference at the time to help somebody feel safe and to be in an open and engaged state where all the great bits of life happen and they can engage well in school and, and, and make progress and, and be part of all the things and be successful. Actually, the, the neuroscience also shows us that those things over time, that relational safe support and, and, and moderating that alongside the stress, actually not only does that make a difference at the time, but those repeated experience of safety and those repeated experience of support actually over time do two wonderful things. They re-expand a person's window of tolerance. So if they've got a reduced window of tolerance and they're easily tipped outside of it and they oscillate between freeze and collapse and fight and flight, we need to expand their window of tolerance so that they can spend more of their time in that open and engaged state and less time oscillating between the negative elements. Actually, by giving those experiences of safety in relationship over time, that's a fantastic way of expanding that window of tolerance. And then the other thing that expands the window of tolerance is those relational bufferings alongside it. So safety in relationships expands window of tolerance. And also the great news is that neuroscience shows us very clearly as well, as well as expanding the window of tolerance, it actually has an impact on what the sensitized stress response. So if somebody has become traumatized and their stress response is sensitized, as we talked about, and therefore they're more likely to be triggered into those autonomic defensive nervous system states involuntarily. Actually, if we can get their stress response to return to a more neurotypical, a more desensitized stress response, then they're less likely to be triggered and they can cope with a higher level of stress. And the great news again is there's experience of safety, that relational buffering over time not only expands the window of tolerance, but also it desensitizes the stress response. It helps people be less hypervigilant, less of the overactive alarm system. So not only does it help at the time, but those experiences of safety over time make the world of difference for people in terms of desensitizing and helping them to be more neurotypical, being able to cope in school, being able to cope in other parts of their life. I think I've summarized that hopefully on the right hand side, on the left hand side there. So it's about providing repeated experience of relational buffering, that co-regulation, that time in with a trusted another person. So not time out away from people. When things go wrong, actually time in with somebody that can help them to calm and regulate and, and be co-regulated. That's the sort of stuff that helps the people return to a more regulated stress response. Um, and also um, the work of Dan Hughes that I'm going to come back to in the third webinar giving experiences of joy and play in a safe relationship. So that's mobilized safety, sort of mobilization, but in a safe relationship rather than mobilized defense. And also providing safety in the form of comfort. So but, uh, immobilization, but in a safe relationship, that's another great way of expanding windows of tolerance and desensitizing a sensitized stress response. Again, we'll do a bit more on that in the third session. Um, a couple of quotes there, and then I'll stop and see if there are any questions, Eric, if that's okay. But just the quotes to remind. So I, lo I love the quote from Karen Traisman. Um, Karen's a psychologist, and she talks about relationships being the most powerful mental health intervention known to mankind. It, it really is relationships, relationships, relationships. They, they really make the world of difference. Stephen Porges, who Developed polyvagal theory, talks about the experience of safety actually being the treatment for children, adults, young people, anybody who's experienced trauma. And then Bruce Perry, who's just some of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, um, he actually talks about the moment that these extraordinary times we need to stay physically distant to be safe, but we also need to find ways to be emotionally close and emotionally connected. I'm going to pause there because that's the first half of today. Erica, are there any particular questions that have come up, or would you like me to carry on with the second half straight away? We don't have any particular questions, Ian. Unfortunately, there seem to be quite a few internet difficulties for people. So um, people are struggling with volume and with pace. So I don't know if there's any way you can speak louder and slower, which would help. But just to reassure people, we are recording this. And we also have a recording that we made earlier and we will send both to you if it's that's um, these technical difficulties are really out of our control. But anything that you can do to compensate Ian in terms of pace and volume, I think would be much appreciated by our audience, if that's OK. OK, here we go. That's that's very useful to know. Thank you. I was, I was blissfully unaware of that. So apologies. I will try and slow down. Um, the challenge is trying to slow down when I'm talking to a blank screen. When I'm usually talking to an audience of people, I can get feedback and see what they can hear and what they can't. And I do talk super fast. So apologies if some of that has got lost as a kind of wall of noise. I will make every effort to slow down a bit. I, I find that hard, but I will try and slow down and, and speak even more clearly if I possibly can. OK, so hopefully what people have picked up so far 
I will just summarise it slowly in case people didn't get it, is that to give messages of safety are absolutely vital as a, as a foundation stone for people who've experienced trauma and to be trauma reducing and trauma informed. We can give messages of safety through the way we interact, the relational support, the relational buffering, giving those cues of non-verbal safety, um, taking the time to interact with people, reassure them, those elements of relationships are really, really powerful in giving safety. The second half that I'm coming on to now, however, is we also need to think about what about when it goes wrong? Because actually the reality is that sometimes there will be children, young people, um, some of whom might be traumatized, some of them might, but they will actually end up in situations that they are dysregulated. Um, they're not in a position where they're in their open, engaged, calm, alert state. They've been triggered into fight, flight, most likely or possibly freezing collapse, but more likely fight, flight. And we need to think and have a plan about what we are going to do for children and young people who find themselves in that situation. So this is what the next 20 minutes is going to be about. Um, what we're touching on here again from the neuroscience is the work of Dr. Bruce Perry. And he's got this wonderful thing called the neurosequential model. And it, it is in the necessary order. So it is those four R's. It does start at the bottom. It starts with regulating. And once we have somebody regulated, then we help them to relate. And once they are regulated and related, then we move up to reflecting and eventually we sometimes not always but sometimes need to do a fourth r which means we need to help people to repair any of the relational damage that might have happened um, during that kind of process so regulate is where we absolutely start and we then go into relate we go into reflect and repair. i'm going to take each of those in turn and give you a bit more detail about what each of those stages of a neurosequential intervention looks like um, absolutely fundamental that we need this planned in advance if we want people to feel safe, we need to have planned how we're going to intervene, what we're going to do, what that's going to look like. And I'm going to talk you through what the research says we need to do. And then at the very end um, of this session, as in about 20, 25 minutes time, I'm going to give you an example of a real interaction with a young person where I try to apply some of these and I'll show you how that works. So I'll talk about the theory and then we'll talk how it actually looks in practice and reality. The reason why I've put the picture of the disconnected brain it's just to remind me, really, um, that one of the things I need to say at this point is if we don't take the time to work our way through the four hours when somebody is having a difficult time, if they are dysregulated and we haven't taken the time to get them physiologically regulated before we start trying to have a difficult and challenging, reflective, reasoning conversation with them, which, of course, we will need to do at some point, um, the reality is the parts of the brain, the cortex, the thinking parts of the brain are simply not available. So if we do not take the time to do the regular and the relating bit first, their children and people will not be in a place where they can have a conversation with us, where they can problem solve, reason, be flexible. All those elements are just not available. The, the, those parts of the brain are offline when somebody is dysregulated. So we need to take the time to regulate them first. Um, thankfully, most of us will be regulated most of the time. But if we come across a young person that's having a difficult time and they're not regulated, regulate them first, then check we're relating with them, then we can get to reflecting and reasoning. I'm going to take those one at a time. So starting with regulate, what you've got on your screen in front of you at the moment is a little section from the behaviour for learning policy of the school that I was the head teacher of up until last year. So my job changed then, but we'll do that another time. So this is about de-escalation. This is a plan of what we do and how we're going to do it. So these are the actions and interventions that we agreed as a staff that we would take that are all based in, in research, psychology and neuroscience. And I'm going to talk you through what those actions and interventions are. So clearly, we, if, if, somebody, if somebody's in an unsafe situation and they're dysregulated and something is going wrong, the very first thing we need to do, we need to think about risk assessing the situation and taking action if necessary to keep everybody safe. We need to keep really clear instructions. Remember what I said about the middle ear muscles tightening, so short, concise, clear instructions, really important, they won't be able to cope. You can imagine how hard I found that to do, um, but they won't be able to cope with lots of fast and, um, and, and complicated language being thrown at them. They need positive feedback as soon as something is going well, so that's great, we can de-escalate that way. We need to give them increased personal space if we possibly can, if it's safe enough to stand back a little bit and not be too confrontational and hovering over them or being you know, front on. We need to use open palm gestures and, and just genuinely think about those non-verbal elements too. Um, I've deliberately put this next bit in bold because attuned non-verbal communication is, is really quite key for us to think about. So when somebody is dysregulated and they're heightened and, and perhaps they're angry and then they're really kind of, you know, actually if we come in really, really calm, it really doesn't communicate to that person that we're taking them seriously, that we get what's going on for them. So what we need to do is we need the research shows, we need to attune to their energy levels, but we do not need to match their emotion. So 
So if somebody's angry, we don't come back at them angry. We don't fight fire with fire. That's just going to be a disaster. We don't become dysregulated too. We, we don't join them in that kind of you know, fight flight state or that freeze collapse state. But what we do do is, is we match their energy. So we would be making it clear to them that we, we understand that and our non-verbal elements of that achievement are extremely important. So we'd be showing that we, we're a little bit kind of heightened, that we're kind of, we get it, okay, we're well, and, and a bit more animated, but we'd be doing that in a way that wasn't angry. We wouldn't be matching the emotion. We'd be attuning the non-verbal element to show that we're not, you know, and then what we do over time through those interactions is we'd slowly bring our energy and our attunement down and hopefully the young person would co-regulate and come down with us gradually as we have that kind of um, physiological contagion on them as, as we go through that. So matching their energy, but not their emotion. We need to listen to the learner. Um, I've, I've talked about pace, which we will touch on in more detail in the third session. So pace is playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy. It's a way of working with children which works incredibly well to build safety and trust. I deliberately put the P of pace in lower cases there because when somebody is dysregulated, we're very unlikely to be successful if we try and crack jokes and use banter, even if we've got a really great relationship with that young person. It probably isn't the time for that. But what we do need to do from the playfulness is we do need to focus on the non-verbal elements of playfulness. So we need to stay calm, light-hearted, as I say, attuned and energised, but at the same time, that kind of, you know, we're not aggressive and, and, and confrontational. We need to show acceptance. When they share things with us, we'll accept and, and use our kind of um, our dialogue and our feedback, our active listening skills, be able to show them that we've listened. We'd be curious. We want to encourage them to tell us what's happened so we can find a way of helping. And empathy, showing that we can empathize with them slightly wordy example there but something along the lines of i can see that something really stressful has happened um help me to understand with inviting the young person to use words to explain or tell us if they possibly can life is quite helpful um life is stands for listen i statements opportunities for forking i need to pronounce that really carefully that was forking with an or um and for everyone to win forking um is actually when somebody is telling us something that they're really agitated about and we are listening and we're trying to find something in that bit that they've told us that we can either agree with we fork into or that we can at least show them we've heard so we're listening for them to say something that we can say oh my goodness so you're telling me that this is what happened and then they felt listened to and it starts to de-escalate the situation we need a calm firm voice we need common language if there's more than one person involved it's absolutely no good if you've got different people giving different messages we all need to be working together as a team especially at the time when somebody's dysregulated. Um, we need to give messages of safety, so we're giving instructions and we're using words like being safe, we all need to be safe, safe choices. Take up time is incredibly powerful. Um, if we possibly can, and clearly if a young person is, is really unsafe, we may not be able to do that, but if we possibly can, we need to give an instruction and, and, and just take a little bit of pace back to let the young person have the opportunity to follow that instruction through. Uh, and we need to decide how much we're then going to go back if they continue to behave differently or kind of do that bit of horse whispering of kind of backing off and letting them say face a bit and, and kind of respond and, and they're much more likely to respond if, if we give them an instruction and we kind of slowly back away and, and give them the, a bit of time to follow that instruction um, rather than actually stand over them and insist they do it there and then. Um, we need to continue to risk assess. Change of face can be quite important. So sometimes when people are dysregulated, it becomes a very personal thing. They're very particularly dysregulated and angry at a particular person. In those situations, we would expect a different adult to switch in and take over. And then we'd, obviously when things are calm, we might then resolve things slightly differently. But there are always times when people might need to a change of face, a change of adult that's just de-escalating. If, if the person has become very angry at the person, more helpful at that time just to, that person to be the big person that backs away somebody else to take over calm things down um time in with an adult extremely important so if somebody is dysregulated we need to really encourage them to come have time with an adult that they have a trusting relationship with somebody they've already built a good relationship with somebody that they, they have kind of key adult ideally uh, or a number of key adults in their team and then they get co-regulation by spending time in it's a Louis Bomber term so rather than time out where we send somebody off who's dysregulated to be on their own which is not very effective what's far more helpful is if they can actually sit with somebody who has helps to calm them and does some co-regulation with them. I'll show you how that looks in an example in about 10 minutes time. And then sometimes time in with somebody isn't quite enough. And what they need is they actually need some physiological regulation activities with that key adult. So they might with that key adult do some breathing, um, some 7-Eleven breathing is fantastic, breathing into the cat of seven, breathing out to the cat of 11 is a great way of calming our physiology down. There's other great somatosensory things that we can do to calm our physiology down. There's kind of rhythmic, grounding, soothing, coping activities, um, all sorts of muscle tensing and relaxing, all sorts of kind of grounding things. What I will do towards the end of this, I'm going to signpost you to a resource, and, and I'm not commissioned on this, but perhaps I should be. Um, you probably can't see that, it's super small, but I'll tell you what it is. 
um, towards the end of this, I've got it written up on the slide. Um, there's a wonderful pack of cards. Um, it's a resource by psychologist Karen Traisman, who I mentioned earlier, and she's developed a pack of called, cards called a Therapeutic Treasure, Treasure Deck, Therapeutic Treasure Deck of grounding, soothing, coping and regulation cards. And what that is, is about 70 different activities that we can try out with children and young people to see if they find them good activities to calm themselves down. And in an ideal world, if we've got children and young people that we know become dysregulated, we know they have difficult times, when they are calm in advance, proactively of a situation that is difficult, we will have tried out with them and experimented and practiced a whole range of different activities and physiological breathing, somatosensory, all those sorts of sensory you know, distractions, there's a whole range of things going on in that box. So try some of those out, help the young people to identify the ones that work best for them. And then when they get to the point where things aren't going so well, they can come and have time in with an adult and they can say, you know, actually the one that works well for me, Ian, is I quite like it when we do this, we do the, this breathing, so we'll use that. So there's a wonderful phrase, isn't there? We don't want to wait for a child to be drowning before we teach them to learn to swim. So actually using some time in advance to try out some of those physiological regulation breaks, work out which ones work best for them and then have them ready so they can use them when things are difficult and they need to be regulating and de-escalating. So that's a real quick whistle stop through regulation and de-escalation. We need a plan um, with the child and young person as to what we're gonna do when they become dysregulated. If we then got them regulated and they're calm, the next R that we need to do, as you probably remember, is to relate. This is gonna be super quick because I'm gonna do more on this in the third webinar, but effectively what we use then is we use our pace approaches. We use pace, the playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy proactively to build a relationship in interactions with children and young people all the time. But equally, once somebody is regulated, we can use PACE to be able to just make that connection again, a connection that will calm them. Um, and if you haven't seen the video that I've put there with the dad and his son on the sofa, I am going to show that in the third webinar. So please, that's worth coming back just to watch that two minute video in itself. It's a beautiful, beautiful interaction between dad and son that's just full of pace and full of attunement. So we'll, we'll come back to that in the session. So we are people then who are reconnecting with the young person. Again, I put a few quotes down the side there that you can read for yourselves. I'm going to come back to more on the relating and the reconnecting element in, in the third webinar. Once we have regulated somebody, to us. That, that sometimes that can happen in no time at all. It can be a minute or two. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. I mean, to give them time to properly calm down. Sometimes we need to even leave it till the next day if they're not able to regulate properly. But what we do then is we need to help them reflect. So we need once the third R, when somebody is calm and something has gone wrong, we need to sit down and have a problem solving conversation with them where they are reflecting and we are planning what action needs to be taken. We need to do it with them. There is this fantastic thing that, again, I'll signpost you to a website with much more information on this, but it's called the Collaborative Problem Solving Approach. If you haven't come across the Collaborative Problem Solving Approach, please, please do have a go at using it. Um, the Collaborative Problem Solving Approach was developed by two psychologists, um, a guy called Ross Green and Stuart Ablon, and there's three steps to it in a necessary order again. The first step, once somebody is regulated and related, is we use an empathy step. So we then listen to the young person, we use our active listening skills and questioning to properly understand what has happened. So we'd be asking the young person questions. So it's, a, you know, I want, I want to help, talk me through what happened, what, once they're calm, they're then telling us, we're asking questions, we're trying to find out without making it feel like an interrogation, but we are asking what's happening, what went on, and we're trying to make them feel listened to, we're trying to understand their side of what occurred in that situation. Once we have had their side explained to us and we, we get it, we've asked questions, we understand it. The second step is the define the problem step. And the define the problem step is actually when we restate or summarise what the child young person said to us, what their perspective is as, what, as to what's happened. And then at the same time, we state what the concern or the issue is from our point of view. Now, when we put our concern or issue out there onto the table, we don't do that in a way that trumps their issue. We just put it alongside theirs to understand the problem. We're defining the problem by saying, okay, so you're telling me that what happened is that before I came along um, and you were out in the corridor and, 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 and you know, actually what happened is one of your friends had said something really quite unpleasant to you in class and, and you, you really didn't like that. So what you've done is you'd then run out of the classroom. So you, you, at that point, I think the word you used was you were upset by what the young person said to you. So you couldn't stay in the room with that young person. You made a choice to leave the room at that point. So hopefully at that point, the young person is saying, yes, Ian, that's what happened. If, if not, they might want to add things to the detail. They might want to correct me. But ultimately, I'll get to the point where I understand their perspective. And then I'm putting my issue on the table. And I'm saying, but what we need to talk about is I get that you are upset, what you used, and that you know your friend had said something, but actually what you did is, is not only did you walk out of your lesson, which isn't ideal, you also threw a chair 
that really isn't very safe. So the issues we need to resolve is we need to work out what we can do about the situation how we defend, but we also need to work out what we do about you leaving the room and throwing a chair. So we've got that kind of definition of what the issue is. And then the third stage to collaborative problem solving approach is the invitation step, where effectively with the child and young person still in that one-to-one -one interaction, we are taking the time to try and think of a range of different potential next steps, solution, ways of making this better, ways that will meet everybody's needs. And if we can, we think of more than one, we think of a range of different things. We hopefully get the young person to share some examples of things that they thought could happen. And we share some things that we think could happen. And then we think about those range of different options and we decide which is the best one, the one that meets everybody needs, and then we go away and then we enact that issue. So it's kind of three-stage problem. The beauty of collaborative problem solving approach, as I put in the bullet points down to the MD, is that over time, repeated experience of use of collaborative problem solving when kids are regulated and they're reflecting with us when something's gone wrong, is it, it helps them solve their problems, which is terrific. It teaches, it builds trusting relationships. We really need that as one of those cornerstones. So it's a great way of building trust and helping people feel safe. But also, it teaches children and young people how to solve the problems for themselves in the future. So the great thing about collaborative problem solving approach is that actually using it over time models for children and young people what we need to do to solve problems. It shows them and helps them to learn those skills. And the research shows that when we do that repeatedly with children, over time they'll start to use those skills themselves. They'll start to be, able to be problem solvers. They'll start to be able to actually use those in their own challenges and difficulties, which is a wonderful thing to be able to teach children and young people. Problem solving, again, is a real cornerstone of resilience. So if we can model and teach children how to solve problems for themselves in those interpersonal issues that come up in life, that's, that's a real gift to give those young people a really skill around emotional literacy. And then the, the fourth thing that's great about collaborative problem solving, if I haven't sold it to you enough already, is that actually it also fits beautifully with that whole trauma-informed and trauma-reducing approach that we're talking about in these webinars, because actually it sets a real culture that says we are listening, we care about everybody, even when something goes wrong, we will listen, we will understand, we will find a solution together. And those messages are the most powerful messages that we can give in terms of reducing violence, in terms of reducing mental health, people feeling heard, feeling listened to, knowing that they will get to have their say, even if ultimately, you know, things have to be done, consequences have to be put in place. If they feel they will be listened to, they feel their part of it will be heard um, and respected, then that's hugely powerful in making a difference. Okay, and I put at the bottom there just to remind us, we all need a good listening to. Um, we don't always get that unless we make a real effort to do it. We'll often get a good talking at, but what everyone needs is a really good listening to. And the collaborative problem solving approach is one way of making sure that we do that as that regulate, relate. This is the reflect stage of the four hours. And then the, the final of the four hours, which we don't need to do all of the time, but sometimes we do, um, is we sometimes need to repair and reconnect. So if I'm being really fair, the three R's are the work of Bruce Perry, the fourth R on top has been added by Louise Bomber as, as a fourth R. And, and we don't need to repair every time, not everything that goes wrong needs repairing, but actually sometimes it will. Most of the time, if it does need repairing, that first bullet point that I've put, that the reaching out, just taking the time at an appropriate point later, either in the day or maybe the next day or later in the week, to go back to that young person where the difficulty has been and just do a little bit of relational moving towards reaching out, re-establishing that connection, showing them that the relationship is bigger than the incident, just re-establishing through a paceful interaction appropriately that connection and, and, and that's a really key bit to do. So I haven't got time to go into it in huge detail. We need something more intensive and we will need to use something like mediation, works really well from restorative approaches. So we work with, very importantly, with the child or young person um, to help them to think about what's happened, who's been affected, um, understand everybody's needs and then take action to move forward so that everybody is um, positively supported um, going forward um, for in, in, in that kind of bit that's gone very badly wrong. We need a, a really quite formalized repair to it. When we do do those kind of restorative conversations that are summarised on the slide with the five key questions, so we're working through with the child or young person on their own initially and um, with a key adult, um, what happened, what were you thinking and feeling at the time, who's been affected, have they been affected, what do we need to do now, and then we think about how we enact a plan after that. Um, actually, we need to do that with them, we need a key adult alongside it, um, but it's really important, the final bullet point, that the key adult works alongside the young person. One of the things that is very often a big issue for children, young people and adults who've experienced trauma is shame. Shame is often very, very powerful emotion and often very close to the surface for children, young people who've experienced trauma and challenges in relationship. So we can very quickly trigger a child into shame and, and the kind of shield of shame where they start to either rage at us or they lie or they minimise what we're trying to tell them. You know, you know, you shouldn't, it's not me, it wasn't me, or they blame somebody else. That They're often shield of shame issues um, that are coming up. And we just need to take a bit of a step back and listen to the young person again, do that 
kind of empathise in that first step of the collaborative problem solving first, use some of our pace approaches, and then go back into reflecting in some of those more challenging bits. So we need to be really conscious of shame. I've mentioned an online training course that I've published that is free, and I'll signpost you to in just a moment, that is available. Um, so there are about nine sessions of those now. The session that's coming out next week is going to be all about shame. So if you want to know more about the things I've just touched on really briefly, there'll be a whole online session um, available to you that I'll sign you into a moment around shame and around moving forward. But it is about connection, belonging community. If we have done that whole reflecting element, sometimes repair needs to be put on top of that. As I say, we don't always need repair. If we do need repair, sometimes just literally walking back towards a child in a relational way can be enough. Sometimes we need something more formal. When we do need something more formal, it's much about doing it with the child, being very conscious of the whole triggering shame and thinking about managing that. Because if we trigger shame, it, it's only going to reinforce some really difficult and we're not going to lead forward to behaviour change. It's going to be a real barrier to that behaviour change. So be cognizant of that too. Okay, some um, example. I said I'll give you an example of a situation where I am using the four R's um, with a young person where they have something has gone wrong. They are dysregulated and I start with them being dysregulated and then I work their way through the four R's. So, I've just got an example there. It's a real example of a young person. I'll give you the context. Um, the lad involved in this interaction is 15 years old um, and he's a big lad. He's, I'm quite big, but he's bigger than me. Um, and he is a really super lad. I have a great relationship with him. He, he's, he's wonderful, but my goodness me, does he lose his temper. And when he loses his temper, like all of us, he becomes very dysregulated. He goes into that fight flight state. Um, and and off, afterwards, he's incredibly apologetic and very sorry. But I guess if you think Lenny from the Mice and Men, um, you know, things go wrong and, and people will get hurt because he's a big lad. Um, so, and then, you know, he'll be very upset about it afterwards, but it's dangerous. So the context is I'm working away on things you need to work away on as a head teacher. And I get a call um, saying this young man is raging. Um, and the context is it's whilst their exams taking place. So he's in year 10, his exams taking place in year 11. It's never a great time for somebody to be raging. Um, and this young man does rage quite well. He's well practiced at raging. Um, so I am then leaving my office and it takes me a minute or two to get to that part of the school. Um, what am I thinking? when I get that call. So I'm calmly getting on with my work, everything seems to be going quite well in school, I'm getting on with bits and pieces, I'm giving a call saying, this young man is raging. I'm then thinking, I'm only human, so in all honesty I'm thinking, oh shit, okay, this isn't good. I'm walking through the school and what I'm making sure I do is I'm making sure I keep myself calm because I've now been a bit triggered. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this could go badly wrong. Is it going to be safe? What am I going to find when I get there? Has anybody been hurt? Um, you know, what damage has been done? Is the exam being disrupted? I'm having all of those thoughts. So I'm having to keep myself calm, do some breathing, do some regulating. And the bit that keeps me calm the most is I've got a plan. I, I know what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it when I get to this young man. So I get there. I've tried to keep myself calm. I've thought about the plan that I'm going to do. It's taken me a minute or so to for the school um, and I've got there and I see the young man and the corridor's a bit of a mess and things are a bit smashed up and he's clearly very dysregulated and looking very kind of hot and bothered and, and not in a good place and I walk up to him and go, you okay? Now on a scale of one to ten it wasn't my best response. What made it a bit of a better response, probably a six rather than a three, um, where 10 is an outstanding response and one a rubbish one. Um, actually, what made it a six rather than a three is that actually the way I said it, the how I did it, the non-verbal, I attuned to his energy. So it wasn't a, oh, okay. It was, it was a, okay, with some energy and, and some kind of care and some, I get it, I'm here to help. The other thing that helped to make it a kind of five or six out of 10 interaction initially is that actually I've got a relationship with this young man. So that really helps because he knows that actually he can trust me. And, and because I've built that relationship, I'm in a position where I really can help him to dysregulate and co-regulate much more than if I hadn't. If I hadn't got a relationship, I can still use my strategies, but they are much more difficult to use unless you've got a relationship with somebody. So, I don't know, okay, I, I get the response, I suppose, in a way that I've asked for. So he goes, no, I'm not in okay. I'm, I've got a choice at that point, haven't I? I can either decide to challenge him there and then in front of the, of the children around and there's staff around and, you know, am I therefore going to say, you can't speak to me like that and start kind of wagging my finger and, and giving him a hard time. I, I decide that because he's dysregulated, that really isn't the thing to do at that point. This is not a win-win situation if I go down that route yet. Clearly, I'm going to pick up with him later on when we're ready for the reflection stage, kind of what happened and how we expect things differently and what consequences there might be to some of the things he's done, but the place is already a bit smashed up. Um, he's really not in a great place. My my judgment at that stage is my better choice is to de-escalate things, help him to regulate, get him away, and then get him to reflect. So I, I don't go at him for the swearing. In, instead, I go, what's happened? And, and thankfully at this point, partly because of the way I've done it and because of the relationship, and I give a bit of take-up time, um, he goes, it's not fair. 
Um, they've all gone to play football and I'm not allowed to and he goes on a, on a long kind of, and at this point, I'm honestly thinking this is great because actually now he's given me something that I can respond to. I've got something that I can use that life bit. I can start to fork and agree with him. I've listened to him. I can use I statements and I can fork. So I can say, oh my goodness, sounds like we've made a mistake on the timetable. I'm really sorry. I, I found something that I can partly agree with what he's told me. So immediately he starts to feel listened to. He starts to feel kind of a little bit more de-escalated, a bit more regulated. So what we then do is we, he agrees. Let's go and have a look at the timetable. Um, so we're walking back through the school, back up to my office. Um, and I haven't got much time, but just a little aside, there wasn't the timetable in my office, but actually that's where I want him. I want him away. So thankfully at this point, he's walking with me back to the school. We're not at that point clearing up the debris, challenging him, because he's still dysregulated. So actually, my question at the bottom of that slide is, what do I do next? Actually, he isn't regulated yet. So he comes and sits in my office, and I still need to spend a little bit of time helping this young man to regulate. So we're going to co-regulate together. Thankfully, we have practiced this, and we have strategies that he will agree to use, and he knows work for him. So we get into the office, we sit in our chairs, and I put my hand on my heart, and I go, oh, do you know what? My heart's beating quite fast. I'm not sure I'm ready yet to have a conversation. Let's just calm ourselves down. Let's get ourselves in the green of that picture that you've got there in, in our state where we're ready to talk. And I'll talk to you about this. I have that on my wall. I have a kind of picture of both circles. And I will talk to young people in, you know, when they're calm about the fact that we need to be in this green, open, engaged state and not tipped into fight, flight or free state. So let's take some action to get ourselves back in the green. So at the moment, you know, I think I'm tipping into amber. So let's just take a minute, if we could, you and I together, just I've got my hand on my heart. And, and, and we're doing some breathing because he knows that breathing works for him. So he's got his hand on his heart. I've got a hand on my heart. We're sitting in opposite chairs and, and we're just kind of going, doing some slow breathing. He also, one of the activities that he's tried and he quite likes, I don't know how well you can see that. Um, it's a little ring. It looks like a dog chew. It's not a dog chew. Um, what it is, is it's, you can buy them in all sorts of shops, but they're um, basically, they're, I mean, strengthers. Kind of squeeze them so my knuckles go and clunk um, and, and it gives you that kind of bit of resistance so what he quite liked because we've tried lots of different activities he quite likes this so he picks up i offer him one of these in fact i offer him two or three different things that he likes and he chooses this one so the magic is he has one of these and i also have one of these in my hand we take them out of our calm box that we've got organized in beforehand and and he sits there and he's squeezing and relaxing with his breathing so we're squeezing in with a hand on the heart still squeezing in and then slowly breathing out that 7-11 breathing we're doing that together and then after a minute or two, I'm going, I'm starting, you know, I'm starting to feel my heart rate is going down. I might be ready to start to have a conversation. I think I'm back in that green area. Let's, let's just make sure, let's give it how are you feeling. And he's interacting with that. And we're doing those things. We're co-regulating through that time in with each other, through that kind of doing an activity together, especially breathing, spending time. And then he gets to the stage where we both agree that our hearts are a little bit calmer. We're ready to talk. And then, so we've done the regulating. I'm now moving to the next R, which is relate. And actually, I've got a relationship with this young man already, so we don't need to do a lot about relating. I just go, are you ready to talk to me? You know, let's see, we've, we've always been able to sort these things out before, reminding me of some positives. Let, let's talk this through, and then we're into collaborative problem solving. So I'm saying, come on, tell me now then, what happened, talk it through. And, and you know, the, the, the stuff that I guess often comes up for all of us, he's fallen out of a friend over outside of school. Um, they've exchanged quite unpleasant social media messages about each other's mums, why does it always be that? Anyway, they've and he's very angry so therefore the agreement is that his football has been switched so he doesn't end up with the same young person that morning because they're likely to end up in a fight so you know we, we, I, I can hear and i'm sounding dismissive but i'm not being i'm listening to him i hear his side of it we then explain you know the collaborative problem solving bit okay i get it if this is this has happened and this we need to talk and then i'm explaining you know the way he's responded isn't isn't usually helpful and i can like swearing and banging things up and what we're going to do to make it so we're then into a problem solving conversation in this case the full file is that they probably need a bit of repair, uh, a bit of repair with me, but mostly a bit of repair with this other friend of his that he's fallen out with outside of school, because that's the bit that's gonna make the difference. To get the example, I hope, I, I, as I say, it's strange talking to a blank screen and not having people to go. But you know, the work I've done in advance with this young man about practicing some different ways of regulating and thinking about ways of calming, building my relationship with him, talking to him about the theory of those concentric circles, all of that proactive work is what then comes into play when it comes to de-escalating, regulating, relating, reflecting and, and, and repairing. I'm with him, okay, we don't have time, I didn't right. Okay, so hopefully I've covered most of that. I've talked about those four R's. There's a few quotes in there in terms of the power of relationships. 
to challenge and make a difference to everything that's gone before. A bit from Bruce Perry about the four R's, and then a bit that I made reference to earlier from the wonderful Kim Golding, who's a psychologist as well, who talks about showing the young people that the relationship is bigger than the incident. Children and young people have been traumatised. When something goes wrong, they'll think that's it. They'll think it's disastrous. You're never going to speak to them again. The relationship is over. Actually, it's giving them the message that that's not the case, that actually we can repair and we can come back from that. I've mentioned a couple of resources, so let me just say this to you. I'm going to last bit of signposting and then we'll stop um, for questions at the end. So I've talked about the online tools that's available. Um, it's all a bit squashed up, that text. But actually, if you Google Sigma Teaching School, there's three online training courses um, that I've delivered to, 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 there that you can make use of. And there's nine of them at the moment, nine sessions. The sessions that I particularly cover today is the first session of that course and the seventh session of that course. So the first session is specifically titled The Transformative Power of Phoenix Safe. And the seventh session in much more detail goes into some of the things about what about when it goes wrong. So if you want more on that, go to that free online stuff, have a look. Um, Karen Traceman, I mentioned those cards, that's, that's the full detail of those. There's a great video if you want to know more about the polyvagal theory. Um, if you Google Seth Porges polyvagal theory, um, you'll get a 20 minute, half an hour video explaining the polyvagal theory in quite an entertaining fashion. It's a thing called Nerd's Night. Who doesn't want to watch a video called Nerd Night? Um, the eagle-eyed of you will have noticed that that's a, 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 a video by Seth Porges, and the person who developed the polyvagal theory is actually Stephen Porges. Seth is Stephen's son, so I guess he's pretty legitimate. Um, collaborative problem solving approach, there's a website there, Think Kids, have a look at that if you want to know more about collaborative problem solving. Great new book from Louise Bomber, um, No Need to Teach Me, goes into these four R's that we've talked about today in much, much more detail. That literally only came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, polyvagal theory in those kind of concentric green, amber and red circles. That's coming out to you as an email as a result of kind of joining this live. So that will come out with the others. And also there'll be two self reviews that come out to you. Um, if you want those, a self review that you can use to think about your practice in relation to transformative power of feeling safe and building safe relationships and safe cues. And equally importantly, there's a self review about how do I prepare for what about when it goes wrong on those four arms that we've just talked about. Aims wise, super quick, and I'm sorry if you weren't able to hear me well, I hope it was kind of good enough, um, is hopefully I've given you the key messages from research. I've given you the opportunity to start to reflect um, some reassurance, I hope, but also maybe some things you could take away and do slightly differently to be even more trauma-informed and even more trauma-reducing. Signposting, I've done most of that. Um, last bit of signposting on this slide is that there is one further webinar. Uh, which is rebuilding trust um, and our own well-being. So it's pace work and then it's about self-care and organisational care. I'm going to do that in two weeks' time. There is the free online course that I've talked about. Just go, there's a website link to it there. I'm also next academic year going to be running pace courses online. Um, they're much more detailed. So if you like this stuff and you want to know more about it, go to the Sigma Teaching School website and there will be, the, they will be on there soon. There will be some pace courses that will be running. There are six sessions of an hour and a half each, so a nine hour course in total, which goes into all the things I've started to talk about today and much more about trauma informed and trauma reducing practices and the science of that and actions we can take practically. So if you want to come and find out more, sign yourself up for a, a more detailed online course. Um, and then you can contact me, which I've put there going forward. That is me done. A big thank you. I really hope some of that has been useful to you. Um, and thank you for listening. Erica, that's over to you for any questions. Thank you, Ian. Again, so much information. And you know what's lovely? As we're sat, I can see the chat and delegates are sharing resources as well as you reference them, which is great to see. We've got um, an interesting question from Vanessa. How do you support young people who are regularly having outbursts due to ACEs and just as you de-escalate de one, the next one happens? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know if that is, you de-escalate one child and another child kind of dysregulates, I guess both of those things happen, don't they? So yeah, I, I think again, the, the young man that I gave the example of is a really good example of that. So, so he dysregulates quite often because of things that have happened in his life and things that go on for him. So he's got that stress sensitivity, even quite small stresses tip him into that dysregulation. So we will have done lots of work in advance using things like those Karen Traceman cards, trying things out that work for him, encouraging to use those proactively as well. So actually rather than waiting for there to be a big blowout for him to then be physiologically bad, we actually give him time throughout the day and we go, actually, do you think it's a good idea maybe to do some of that breathing or some of that muscle tensing and relaxing? We're trying to help him learn to self-regulate, but 
but the, the message I guess in that, and there's much more on the online course in this, is that to help somebody to learn to self-regulate, the only way they're going to learn that is to have lots of experience of co-regulation. And if the young person has had those adverse childhood experiences and hasn't learned to regulate and hasn't had those experiences of co-regulation from adults that can buffer those, the most effective thing we can do is give them lots and lots of experience of co-regulation with an adult, try out things that work for them, encourage them to practice them, to use them proactively as well as reactively. Um, and sometimes it can feel relentless. It can feel that, you know, we're constantly putting out fires. My work is mostly in special schools and alternative provision. So, you know, you're absolutely right. Things start to when it triggers again. Um, so it's, it's, you know, but actually those things that we do to help children feel safe to de-escalate over time, they do have a really, really significant difference. So if you feel you're putting out lots of fires, actually you're still making a big difference. But another bit just to add, and I will stop on that bit, is that if you are somebody that is constantly your role is you're having to de-escalate and help people to regulate, you do also need to really look after yourself. So come back and listen to the second half of the next webinar, because actually that will start to be contagious for you. You're trying to stay in your open, engaged, calm and alert state. But if you're constantly helping other people de-escalate, you will be getting a bit more physiologically aroused each time yourself, potentially. So you need to have strategies to look after yourself as well to make sure during the day that you're staying physiologically calm and then you can be that stress regulator for the children and young people as well. Thank you, you, Ian. And as you say, it's so important that we do look after ourselves so that we can um, yeah, meet the needs of all of our students. Thank you once again, and really interesting webinar with lots of information. I'm just going to share my screen now with some whole school send information. So just to um, come down to, um, and we're going to go from, not from that slide, excuse me a moment, it's a new share this one. Hopefully this will come on. Um, wait a moment. So can I urge you don't, to not only join the community of practice but to really get involved with what's happening. There is a wealth of resources on the SEND gateway both fr these frameworks for school improvement, as well as opportunities for CPD events across, um, which are free, and information from our partners as well. I'm just going to reference one of the resources, which is the Send Reflection Framework. And within the Send Reflection Framework, there is a section about creating an environment which is conducive to effective learning. And this links so closely with lots of the information that Ian has given, has, has given us today. So finally, just before we go, um, this is the link to the resources. Thank you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at our final web webinar, which is on Tuesday, the 7th of July. Thank, thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.